It's the middle of the night on 4th of August 1914. War has just been declared. A cable ship named CS Alert is dragging the seabed of the English Channel. They are there to sabotage German telegraph cables, forcing Germany to send messages by less secure channels. By November, the British had three German codebooks and worked out how to decipher German naval messages. This, and the events that followed, would change the course of the bloody conflict, help end the war, and give rise to Room 40 and MI1B, as well as the government code and cipher school that would famously go on to crack the Enigma machine at Bletchley Park in the Second World War. While Bletchley Park and the Enigma machine are well known, many British codebreakers in fact learnt their trade during the First World War. Hundreds of codes and ciphers were broken concerning tens of thousands of documents. So it gave the British a real advantage in many ways during that war. But it all started with those underwater cables. The development of the transatlantic cable was one of the great technological achievements of the late 19th century. But it would just be a cable and it would lay across the sea from one end of the Atlantic to the other or to Europe armoured cables, so they're very well protected and the transmission over them would be in Morse code. They were primarily commercial cables, but they also were used by the military. Britain dominated the cables and managed to see what other people were doing. Britain didn't think there would be a war. The government was hopeful it could be avoided and had been busy with the threat of a civil war in Northern Ireland and the task of setting up the welfare state. The First World War broke out in the summer of 1914 and very quickly turned into an absolutely dreadful, bloody morass of violence and gunfire. Britain realised these cables could give them the upper hand, so a cable ship called the Alert set sail across the English Channel. This was not a military vessel. It was, in fact, owned by the General Post Office. They cut a few German cables that connected Germany to the United States and started destroying all of Germany's international network of wireless stations, cutting off Germany from communicating with the rest of the world. There were now very few cables owned by neutral countries that Germany could use. Worse still for Germany, almost all cable communications in existence had to pass through the Central Telegraph Office in London then onto a tiny relay hut in Cornwall for onward transmission across the Atlantic. The Germans turned to other communication methods, including radio, which had just been installed on their ships. Unlike the British, who were more careful, German fleets were sending daily status and position updates at high signal strength and freely chatting to each other over the radio. Multiple wireless stations started intercepting material. Unfortunately for the War Office, they were all in code. The Royal Navy and the British Army didn't really have a separate code-breaking unit. Very little, if any, code-breaking can be done in Britain before the First World War. When the war started, they immediately set up Room 40, which handled the um, code-breaking for the Navy under the, the Admiralty, and MI-1B for the Army. As well as being coded, the messages were enciphered, which added an extra layer of complexity to hide the message but a chance discovery at sea could hold the key for Britain and her allies. A small squadron of German ships went to attack some Russian ships in the Baltic. There was a bit of a firefight and one of the German ships was grounded and it was abandoned. On that ship, the Russians recovered three copies of the main German naval code book. Later, two more German codebooks were discovered at sea, one for the commercial shipping network, the other used primarily for diplomatic and political purposes. So a mere four months into the war, Britain now had a near-complete set of German naval codes, but they had to break the cipher before they could use the codebooks. You'd have frequencies of use of words, common phrases. Once you've broken about 50% of the words in a codebook, you are able to decode a much higher percentage of the words of the message. And once the codebook had been cracked, the team set to work. It was almost entirely writing bits of information on bits of paper. The cryptanalysis section of the British Admiralty ended up in room 40 on the first floor of the Admiralty's old building in Whitehall, London. It started off quite small, you know, you're talking about half a dozen people. They were all crowded into one small office. Then rapidly, as they grew the size of the organisation, they then had to have other offices. 
but the name stuck. Room 40 recruited its fair share of characters. Rear Admiral Henry Oliver was head of intelligence at the outbreak of the First World War, and he handed the intercepted messages to Alfred Ewing, who initially managed Room 40. Reginald Blinker Hall, named for his habit of blinking very rapidly, was the British Director of Naval Intelligence from late 1914 to 1919. Dilly Knox was notorious for installing a bath in his office, from which he would do his code-breaking. Nigel de Grey was fluent in French and German, and even future Prime Minister Winston Churchill was involved in Room 40 and received daily updates. All this expertise converged in Room 40, a department that played a significant role in multiple clashes during the First World War, from the First Battle of the Marne in 1914 to naval battles, including Dogger Bank and Jutland. Around about 1916, wireless becomes much more important on land, at sea and in the air. By this time, wireless equipment was smaller and portable, whereas at the beginning of the war, you needed two or three horse-drawn carriages. German spies would take off, identify targets, then send coded coordinates to the artillery for bombing. British codebreakers had to work fast to stop the attacks. Britain was also intercepting messages to and from German zeppelins that were planning to bomb Britain. The Germans were using direction finding and triangulation to communicate their whereabouts during these attacks. But for various reasons, including the diligent work of Room 40, Britain had a better idea where the zeppelins were than the pilots of the zeppelins themselves. And this led to the defeat of the Zeppelin War. As the German Zeppelin campaign came to an end, Germany focused its efforts to starve Britain out of the war. Submarine warfare is what led to the Zimmermann telegram, undoubtedly the most important intercept decoded by Room 40 during the First World War. I don't know of uh, historical parallels where a single telegram has had such a major effect in a major historical conflict as the Zimmermann telegram. The British naval blockade had successfully prevented weapons and food getting into Germany. The Germans retaliated with a counter blockade, using submarines to shoot at British and neutral merchant vessels. American merchant ships and liners with American citizens on board were particularly targeted. Uh, this was upsetting America, upsetting Woodrow Wilson, and he was desperately trying to put off going into war. In January 1917, Arthur Zimmermann, a top-level civil servant from the German Foreign Office, dispatched a now infamous coded message to the German ambassador to Mexico via what they assumed was a secure American telegraph cable. It was intercepted and passed to Room 40 on the morning of 17th of January. The telegram actually contained two messages, so Nigel de Grey and Dilly Knox set to work and had partially decoded the telegram by the next day. The telegram seemed to propose that Mexico join Germany in an alliance against America. When the fully decoded telegram was revealed, the revelations had the desired effect. There was outrage amongst the public in America, and that gave Woodrow Wilson the political coverage to join the war. America joining the war didn't immediately swing the balance. The number of American soldiers on the field was quite small, but the German army was getting smaller, whereas the Entente side had this promise of a continued flow of American troops. So German morale began to sink until it finally collapsed in mid-1918. Jutland and the Zimmermann saga are two well-known contributions from Room 40, but there are many unsung minor victories, including the capture of German spies and arms vessels. The people who worked in Room 40 and MI1B were sworn to secrecy. There is an awful lot of false information put out at the end of the war to try and minimise what was done, to make it sound like good amateur luck, whereas in fact there was a lot more organisation and preparation in it. These cover stories were designed to explain away any leaked code-breaking activities and to give the impression that the British were unlikely to repeat their success in a later conflict. As a result, Germany and others would later underestimate Britain with stunning effect in the Second World War. After the First World War, Germany realised the British had been breaking their codes, so they developed cipher machines of great complexity, such as the Enigma machine. Room 40 and MI1B were merged to create the Government Code and Cipher School, the first ever peacetime code-breaking agency. They would eventually end up at Bletchley Park shortly before the Second World War. Although Room 40 has evolved from its First World War days, the work accomplished within the old Admiralty building changed the course of history. Americans didn't want to join the war. 
Room 40 in the Zimmerman Telegram gave them the impetus to do so. Lachey Park certainly wouldn't have existed without Room 40 and MI1B, which means that we would never have cracked the Enigma Code and the Geheim Schreiber Code. 